the Carpathians, a 190,000 square kilometer wilderness weaving across seven countries through Poland, Slovakia, Romania and the Ukraine. This vast untamed region is home to most of Europe's surviving large carnivores and its last great forest. More than half of this ancient mountain range lies within modern day Romania. Here, man has lived in harmony with nature for millennia. But today, that delicate balance is under threat from neglect and ruthless exploitation. We'll follow the changing seasons from the ripe glory of autumn through the depths of the winter to the first flush of spring and witness a landscape of unparalleled beauty, a world of vivid colors and timeless traditions. We'll also show once and for all why Romania is the custodian of a priceless treasure and ways in which we can all help to protect it. Autumn in the foothills of Carpathia is a time of plenty. As the fruit ripens on the tree and the fields turn to gold, humans and animals race to gather everything edible before the onset of winter. These are scenes that have played out unchanged for thousands of years. While the Romanian lowlands are now given over to intensive modern agriculture, here in the foothills, traditional farming techniques still preserve the incredible biodiversity endemic to this region. The onset of autumn is also a time for celebration, as the rich bounty of these fertile hills, meadows and forests is brought to market. As the livestock, the cattle, the sheep and the goats are brought down from the mountain, and in some cases end up here on the table, this becomes a very important time of year because all over the country right now, harvest festivals are occurring and people are preparing for winter. So this is the time when they bring home the bacon, quite literally. Within weeks, thousands of square miles of mixed forest are transformed for a brief moment to burnished red, copper and gold. There is no other place in Europe where you can appreciate such a blaze of arboreal colour and on such a majestic scale. There is also no time of year when man comes into closer proximity with our rivals in the food chain. While people are filling their freezers, Romania's endangered large carnivores are also busy storing up enough fat reserves to carry them through the winter. Bears come down to the villages and scrump apples from the orchards, but this also leads to close encounters with livestock that can have unfortunate results for all concerned. To protect both parties, sometimes bears are relocated, or if they become too domestic, then there are now several bear sanctuaries like this one in Zarnesht, which provides a home for bears that have been abused as pets, or kept in captivity, or those that have lost their fear of man. Whilst none of these bears can ever be released, 
they do get to live out their days in spacious grounds, with natural surroundings and food on tap. The Ursian equivalent of a five-star hotel. Small compensation, but at least safe from the further predations of man. Elsewhere, progressive hotels and eco-lodges are taking advantage of our growing fascination with Europe's largest carnivore. And places like the Mikesh estate in Zabala offer guests the chance to spot bears in the wild. With almost 2,000 hectares of surrounding forest protected from logging and hunting, Mikesh has created a sanctuary for wildlife, which is also drawing visitors from all over the world. I caught up with gamekeeper turned warden Levente, who spends his spare time shooting fauna with video, stills and a motion sensor camera. I'm spending uh, many time here in the forest and uh, making photo. And uh, I put this camera here because I know uh, here when it's winter, coming here uh, down the bear and uh, deer and stag and the predators hunting here, this area. Here I see uh, this uh, winter uh, wildcat and lynx. A lynx? Lynx, a lynx footprints, yes. That would be unbelievably exciting, but it's very hard to, to ever see lynx. They're like ghosts, yeah. aren't they? Yes. Two burrows there. So this would be like the front patio. Obviously, it's going to start recording me now. Yes, you are the first. I am the first bit of wildlife. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Camouflage, great idea. So the batteries will last at yes. least a week. Yes. OK, well, we'll keep our fingers crossed and see what we get. OK. <laughs> The Mikesh estate styles itself as a high-end tourist destination. With two existing lodges, a converted stables, a boating lake and a manor house under restoration, this is a far cry from the ruin owner Alex Chowdhury and his brother Gregor confronted when they first had their property restituted in 1998. The castle and surrounding forest has been in the family for generations prior to the communist regime. But only in the last few years have they been able to open their gates to the public. These possibilities in tourism, they were never there in this extent. Nowadays, we are talking about having sustainable tourism on our property, every property. This was never possible 50 years ago here in this country. It's the first time it's possible, and I think this is a future scenario. Everybody's owning a piece of forest, everybody's owning a piece of land, everybody would have a farmhouse. So you have capacity here, you have everything here you need to start up a business like this. And this would be my most beautiful scenario. You have the Provence, you have Tuscany. This could become a, a very interesting, well-known European tourism destination. While the historic appeal of rural Romania is beginning to be discovered by the outside world, it goes way further back than the days of the Saxons, Vlad Tepes or even Stephen the Great. Civilizations and cultures have existed here for millennia, an evidence of early Neolithic settlement can still be seen in the hills above Colts. These cave houses were hewn by hand from bare rock, often high in the cliffs, and remain cloaked in mystery to this day. But it is still the appeal of the forest and a chance to reconnect with nature that is drawing people to this part of the Carpathians. While many areas are being ruined by the spread of cement and concrete culture, there are more and more projects that are trying to harmonize with the surrounding landscape. Take this treehouse complex near Predal, which has appealed to so many people it's often booked for months in advance. 
What's really stupid is that it's harder to get planning permission for a building like this than for an ugly modern concrete hotel. When these tree houses were first constructed, the local authorities insisted they were taken down and imposed a fine. It's only because they managed to get them redesignated as a temporary structure that they're still here. What would you rather see in a forest? A building that involves cutting down the trees and leaving a scar on the landscape or something that blends effortlessly with it. It's not rocket science. But the success of tourism in the Carpathians depends mostly on restoration and preservation, rather than new development. Situated in the foothills near Sigishwara is a small Saxon village, which is creating a role model for other historic communities. We discovered Kund through my father who came here with relief goods in uh, 89 and fell in love with the area. The same happened to me and my wife when we came traveling to Transylvania. We decided to sell our property in Germany, move here and to set up a small guest house. When we bought the first house here to turn it into a holiday home, the people in the village thought, well, this looks like a nice idea. They also had homes they renovated for guests to come. We were letting them out for them. And for us, it was a great way to be integrated in the community and also to bring a little bit of prosperity to it. It worked tremendously well, and four years later, we decided on building and opening a small restaurant in the village. What changes have you noticed in the community since you first moved here? Well, I think the most striking change is the, the composition of the village. People have started to move back into the village. More younger people are staying here now. By being able to offer jobs to people, the community is remaining intact, so people are not leaving. In neighboring village, we are seeing this trend. Another thing is that the houses are being renovated, of course, not only the houses which are for rent, but also their own houses. People are taking more care of them. You can see quite a few splashes of fresh color on the houses, and that's something that we are extremely happy about, to see that renovating houses is inspiring other people to do the same thing. And you've trained up quite a lot of people. I mean, indirectly or indirectly, there are quite a few people that work for Valley Verde, aren't there? We are employing at the moment 24 people on a full-time basis all year round. So we bring in people from the Next Again village now because Kunde has only 120 people inhabitants. The success of a location like this also depends on the range of activities it offers, like truffle hunting, for instance. This and similar culinary-related adventures have made Valle Verde a popular destination, particularly with gastronomes. We have a very international clientele, about 50% Romanians, 50% of foreigners. Among the Romanians, the people who are coming are people who love their country, who like to rediscover their roots, the beauty of their own country. Foreigners are looking for the last unspoiled wilderness in Europe. What's the secret? I think there are some key factors. First one is authenticity, not doing something that doesn't belong into the area. We love that village, this is why we're here, we don't want to turn it into anything else. It's not meant to be like a Mickey Mouse resort or something like that. The second point for us was Romanians have a wonderful personal hospitality. We managed to develop that element to transform the personal into the professional side. I think that's another very important thing and education, education, education. So training our people, training the chefs in the kitchen, training the waiters, training the, the craftsmen who work with us and constantly evolving I think is something that contributes to the success we are having. Winter transforms Carpathia into a different world. Temperatures here regularly drop to as low as minus 25. And for man and animals alike, staying warm and well-fed is vital for survival. 
For these bison, a species hunted to extinction hundreds of years ago, but now happily back in several regions across the country, some extra help is still needed through the coldest months. This rewilding project near Armanish and others like it aims to reintroduce bison and re them to surviving in the wild. It is hoped that their presence will further enhance biodiversity and help regulate forest and alpine pastures. The process of filling your larder for winter is so ingrained in the collective mind that it has almost ritualistic symbolism for many of the people living in the Carpathians. Here in the Maramurish, the annual pre-Christmas pig slaughter is a time for celebration and an event in itself. Marianne, this is a pagan tradition originally, isn't it? Yes. Eu de când mă știu, tăiatul porcului era ceva frecvent anul de an. Ce important de știut este faptul că acest obicei este păgân. De ce? Pentru că s-au descoperit în sigetul Marmației un templu dacic, cum se sacrificau porți în această perioadă de Crăciun. Era, de fapt, sacrificarea adunată și dată închinată zeilor. Ce de înținut minte este faptul că porcul, pe lângă faptul că este un obicei tradițional, noi mai mult îl folosim pe parcursul unui an întreg ca și hrană. Pentru că se fac crnați, se fac cartaboș, se fac jumere, șoldul din spate se duce pe roada Paștelui chiar la Sfințit. Adică nu există cele mai importante sărbători de peste an, nu pot exista fără porc. Numai un om care nu-i harnic, să zic așa, nu taie porc în această perioadă. Nu, m-am venit cu fundul. Pune-te-l aici, nu m-am pune-te-l aici. And it would have taken place around the solstice rather than Christmas, so a little earlier. Yes. Deci se taie în solstițul de iarnă. De ce? În primul rând pentru faptul că avem nevoie de o perioadă mai răcoroasă. Avem nevoie de sprig pentru ca să nu se strice carnea. Iar pe lângă asta, ca să stea la afumat într-un mod tradițional, ai nevoie de o perioadă rece și de fum efectiv care să urce pe el. Atunci trebuie să fie o perioadă rece afară. O să vedeți dacă o să ajungem și la perioada când se urcă cârnații și se afumă în mod tradițional, o să vedeți că ei stau efectiv agățați pe o singură botă. Dacă e cald afară, ei se strică. Vrăza, mă, ce bună e, Maria, așa n-am mâncat o reație în cap. Zace să bada pe ele, zace să bada. O, ce șurt avem de faci, mă, Maria. Una zi bună. Așa, însă, păi să-l punem până la Paști, nu umblă nimele. Once the meat has been prepared and packed away, the community gathers for a traditional feast in time-honored fashion. I think this is something that we've lost in Western Europe society. We don't understand where our food comes from, and we don't recognize what's involved in bringing it to the table. It was quite traumatic seeing the pig being slaughtered this morning, but they don't waste a single bit of it, and this provides a feast for the whole of Christmas. So, I think without further ado, I'd better go join in.
Christmas in Romania is celebrated with a bit more gusto than in many other parts of Europe. The need for warmth, food and friendship to help get you through the Siberian conditions has sustained a close sense of community and towns and cities across the country compete for the brightest and most colourful festivities. One city that affords access to some of the more vertiginous areas of the Carpathians is Sibiu, voted European City of Culture 2007 and famed for its stunning Saxon architecture. It also makes a good base camp for forays into the snow-clad Fagrash Mountains that form a great wall to the south of the city. Here, amidst lofty peaks, exists a rather different example of an eco-lodge and one that has almost zero impact on the environment. Romania's famous ice hotel is only here for a few months each year and is annually reinvented with new themes and freshly carved rooms. Other parts of the Carpathians are less accessible during the snowy months and demand more than a sturdy pair of boots and warm clothing. Enough food and plenty of fresh water is essential to maintain energy levels in the face of freezing temperatures. Like this ferrous mineral spring, you can see from the rust colour as it runs away down into the river. 100% pure mineral water bubbling from deep underground. I do mean bubbling. It comes out precarbonated. Extraordinary. Just need a slice of lemon and some gin. The risk of avalanches can also make hiking a precarious pastime. However, the rewards justify the extra trouble and research needed. And against the brilliant white backdrop, there's always the faint possibility of spotting a predator or two. Although the Rodna Mountains are purportedly teeming with wolves, when you get up here and see the scale of this national park, you realise it's a bit like looking for a needle in a haystack. Admittedly, a very beautiful haystack. I think that's the point. It's the journey that matters. I'm just lucky to be here. As the snows melt and the first flowers push up from the forest floor, these mountains are transformed once again.
it's time for the shepherds to saddle their mules and drive their flocks back up the mountain in search of fresh pasture and lush alpine meadows. The land comes back to life and carnivores and their prey venture forth in search of readily available supplies of food. The European brown bear, despite official statistics, is a species in decline. Legal and illegal hunting and the destruction of their habitat could mean that in a few generations they will be extinct here as they are in most other countries. With more protected areas, green corridors and a ban on game hunting of large predators, this outcome could be prevented and Carpathia will continue to provide a safe habitat for this majestic animal. With temperatures rising, it was time to return to Zabala and see if Levante had been having any success with our camera trap. The moment of truth, Levante. Yes. <laughs> okay, you've got the memory card there. Yes. So this is the first one. It's a wild boar family. Wild boar. Yes. Look at them. They're completely oblivious to the camera, aren't they? Wildcat, yeah. Wildcat, yes. And this is a male. It was a big one. Would they breed with domestic cats? Would they come down and breed? They with... come down here in the village and. and yeah. Have yes. a go at the local ladies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the female wildcats, they don't breed with the male toms? Or no, 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 no. Just uh, the male come here. Just the males. Yes. So, th so the actual wildcat population stays pure? Yes. So we've got a fox, badger, and a wildcat. We want something bigger. No, you're wow. joking. Don't, don't, for no. Is that what I think it is? Lynx. No! Lynx. No, we've got a lynx. It's beautiful. Oh, my God. You knew this, didn't you? No. <laughs> Did you know this? <laughs> this I is cannot a believe young, it. Look at it. Well, this is the holy grail of large predators to film and catch on camera in Romania. Yes, I know here lives this uh, forest, but yeah. not easy to see. I mean, we, we know they're there. It's like a wolf. You know they're there, but to, to actually yeah. see one. As many people live here in the village and all life uh, don't see lynx and wolves. No, it's too smart. He's a predator. He's not coming here. It's huge, though. I mean, you know, it's big as a Labrador. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Uh, 40, 40 kilo maximum. Why is it that animals always show you their ass on camera? The moment you've got a camera, <laughs> they just point their bottom at the camera. Yes. You never see their head. You must find this, right? Yes. Come on, turn around, turn around. No, don't leave. Uh, look, a bit of chin. Oh, that's so frustrating. But it's amazing we've got him. Yes. This is the thing about, about the Carpathian Forest. You know, they're so dense and so extensive. And they're full of wildlife, but very often you never see it, but you know it's there. Yes. And uh, we need to keep it that way. For the people living high in the Carpathians, the onset of spring provides a chance to restock and return to civilization. Many settlements are cut off for much of the winter and the return to sunshine and warm weather means an end to long months of isolation. I joined local guide Ili Radoy in the Cherna Mountains for a trek to the tiny village of Inalets and to see how and why people still choose to live in such remote communities. OK, so this is where the fun starts. Yeah, we are going to the hamlet. And the main way up and down is through this. Yeah, it's the fastest way to go down from the hamlet to road, to main city, from this valley. So if you want to come and do a bit of shopping, yeah. buying some groceries, they take their backpacks and they hike down here. Each day. Each, not each day, surely. For one of them, yeah, each day. Really? I think it must be hard for some people to imagine 
why they choose to live like this? I think that they are choosing to stay here because they, they are feeling that they belong here and this is their house. The human being in connection with nature and this is great. Imagine it's like a stairway to heaven. A very rickety stairway yeah, to heaven. Yeah. yeah, but it's a very original way. No, absolutely. It's, there's, it's, there's nothing not authentic about this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. How many relatives have you got still living here? Oh, almost 20. Really? There are relatives from my grandfather. Just in, in Aletsa or in other villages around the area? Around the area, the whole village. So really, this, this has been a place you've been coming to all your life? Yeah. In the last three years, I come each weekly here. Not a bad job bringing people up here for a living. No, it's great. It's great to come here we, weekly. I feel full of energy. I like to come here and to enjoy the nature, the view, the, the food and the people. The people have different values than in the city, big city. So this is the school. And in 2015, they have 50 years of learning here. How many children? Now there are almost 20 here, but the school there are four. So the other kids get schooled down yeah, in the town? Yeah, or they are much bigger. We have four children and four com computers. Four computers? Yeah, they are online. So they've got the internet here as well? Yeah, of course. They are just like in a private school here. <laughs> and, and presumably they get very good education because there's only four of them. So yeah. they, the teacher gives them the full attention. Exactly, this is good. How does the teacher get up and down? She's coming now, she's a teacher, and she's coming Monday and leaving from here Friday. OK, so she actually sleeps in the yeah. school. It's a boarding school. Yeah. yeah. It's a little boarding school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's great. Hello, Saruna. Bună ziua, bună ziua, bună ziua. Ce faceți? Hai să vă pup. Ia A venit caș. acum cu Saruna. prieten cu Charlie. Îmi pare bine? Îmi pare bine Mulțumim. că Mulțumim. Mulțumim, mulțumim. 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 Intrăm, mergem da. tușo după duntale? Da, da mulțumim, okay. mulțumim tușo. So, um, how long have you lived here? De 60 de ani de când am venit la bărbat. M-am căsătorit cu el și m-am făcut casă, m-am făcut copii. I'm it must be quite hard living here. Surely it would be easier to move to Bali Hakilani. am avut că trebuie să fac casă, fac casă, grajdur cum să dușe la noi că noi n-am avut să trebuie să le luăm toate și vedeți toate din mâna mea și bărbatul și al socri. Așa m-am învățat și aici îmi place, nu e colani să treacă mașini să am zgomot. Când stau cât să stau liniștite. How often do you leave the village? No, coborăm des. La o săptămână, la două, la trei, cum le apucă, că nu putem să coborăm în tot timpul. What about health care? Do they send doctors here? Nu vine. Le duce noi jos. Aici nu vine el, că nu are la ce să vină, că nu poate vine urca cu mașina, dar le duce noi, coborăm noi. Da, el, dacă avem nevoie de el, dacă nu, nu. <laughs> okay. Pe nu, că aici trăim la aer. And how do you feel about tourists coming to the village? Ne pare bine că îi vigem, stăm cu ei de vorbă, le întreabă ce facem, ce lucrăm, se aduc mai departe, iar întorc. Is it sad for seeing people leaving? Da, au plecat și neamuri, au plecat și cumnat și cumnat, au plecat cam mulți. Când stai să te gândești, parcă e pustin. Unii s-au dus la oraș, unii au s-au dus la moarte, cum au zis, s-au dus de... Am udit cam singur, că nu prea este lume. Nu? Nu prea este. Și e urât acum, abia așteptăm să vină niște turiști, să mai putem să mai vorbim și noi. Acum și mai ies, mai ies vreo 20, 30, dacă mai ies, dar nu mai ies. S-au părăsit, au plecat, s-au dus la oraș, s-au mai tineriat, nu mai vrea să șadă. Nu-i place munca, nu-i place vițele. 
Noi am tănut oaie, vacă, capră. Ei nu mai vreau să tână nimic. What message would you give to the young people in Romania? Îi transmit la toți vișinii, la neamuri, să vină la pământe, să lucre cum am lucrat noi, bătrânii. Aș vrea să vină nepoțe și vișinii, să fim mai mulți, să vină la muncă, să muncim toți împreună și să stăm și la un par de țuică, să bem. Mersi mult! The prosperity of rural communities also has a direct effect on the environment. A healthy revenue from tourism means there are fewer incentives to make money from less sustainable activities. Despite its seemingly pristine wilderness, Romania currently loses nearly 10 million cubic meters of forest illegally every year. And while more and more people in the country are waking up to the decimation of their natural heritage at the hands of big Western companies, the rate of destruction is still growing. Campaigner and environmentalist Gabby Pound took me to one of thousands of affected areas. That's astonishing, Gabby. The whole mountain has been erased from the bottom of the valley to the top of the mountain. And that's completely illegal, isn't it? Absolutely illegal. It's a 35.4 hectares of forest being clear cut in a couple of days, far away from people's eyes. Nobody knew what is going on. Nobody could hear the chain, so it's way too far from any human settlement. Yeah. It's so bad that, that there cannot be natural regeneration. Even if you try planting, the chances of success are very, very low. And you can yeah. see where the soil erosion is, is already it's all coming kicking down. Kicking in see, from the logging truck, it's going to be it's, landslides. It's, it's too big, it's all coming down. Yeah. I think we should try let's, get a closer. Let's take a close look, yeah. yeah. How can something like this be allowed to happen on this scale? I mean, so many people must have turned a blind eye to what's going on. The amount of machinery, people up here felling it. I mean, the local authorities must know. It's not just local authorities. We have very poor legislation. As it is, it's very complicated. Our controls are very weak. Sanctions are nothing. Those guys can be fined, but they will still exist, and they will cut the next day in another place and they get richer by taking the wood than with the poor fine. We had this new forest code coming into force last year, which is trying to make better uh, law enforcement and, and, and better, uh, better checks. But, you know, these forest thieves, they are very creative. The hunger of huge sawmills of, of uh, multinational corporations which are so greedy they can eat up of three million cubic meters wood per year we take pictures we take footage we we, we collect scientific data technical data from the field we bring it to the media we bring it to the authorities and we push for better legislation and better enforcement surely you know if you're disrupting business to a certain degree they can make you disappear Corporation grid has no limits. They tried to kill me and not once. Imagine a real situation when I was just taking a picture, starting to document a, a, a an, area. an area, and suddenly a bunch uh, of huge thugs came and started to uh, kick and punch to kill. I was lucky with the diversion that I could manage to run away with a cracked head and broken ribs. So running away saved my life because we are non-violent, we will never react, but they had so much anger. I guess you've got to kind of be careful where you're going now and raising your head above the parapet. Yes, but how can I go to sleep when I know that it's still happening? I know exactly what we have to lose. Europe lost most of its wilderness. 
this is not uh, uh, an issue of Romania anymore. This is an issue of all Europeans and, 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 and global citizens. With all this destruction, the country is still the shelter for most of the virgin forest in the whole Europe. So I'm fighting for that. I will not go to sleep. I will have no rest until we save more of it. Besides its ecological wealth, the Carpathian mountain range is perhaps the last region in Europe with an enduring historic legacy, although this is changing fast. Places that could become beacons for cultural tourism are compromised by a rash of concrete and cement. Writer and campaigner William Blacker, among many others, is fighting to protect Romania's best preserved villages from the rise of termite tourism. William, when did you first come to Romania? I came in January 1990, about two weeks after the revolution. I'd never been here before. I had the faintest idea what I was going to find. I'd read a certain amount in the newspapers before I came about the revolution and also previous to the revolution there had been in the British newspapers a lot about the destruction of historic villages. The reality that I found was very, very different. In fact, I found this great treasure trove of traditional buildings all beautifully preserved, being lived in and, and used as they always had been. Today, that's obviously changed quite a bit. Yes, things have changed. A lot of houses have been destroyed and that's... I, I, think is very sad. I mean, obviously, that things do need to progress and people need to modernize their ways of life. And I think it would be extremely sad for Romanians in the future if the history of the country is destroyed and then they suddenly wake up and realize what they've done and, and, and it's too late. But how does one go about protecting these communities? Well, I don't think it's impossible to, to create uh, hotels and, and guest houses which are in keeping with the local architecture. I mean, a lot of the things which the foundations that I work with are doing very much go in that direction, trying to persuade people to fit the buildings that they have and the architecture they have into the, the capabilities of, of creating rooms for people to stay in. Tell me more about the work that you're personally involved in, the charities you're working with protecting the buildings and the architecture. And we have a tile and brick kiln in the village of Aposh near Agneto, which is a great success. It produces traditional handmade tiles and bricks, uh, and they make a profit. Mm. Up until now, it was quite difficult to get these due to the competition for all the modern factories producing uniform, cheap tiles. All the old kilns had closed down. But actually, the funny thing is that you can actually produce the traditional ones at just about the same cost as, as the industrial ones. And they are the ones that, if you want to do this work in, in historic conservation, you have to use the traditional handmade tiles. So, William, what is it you like the most about Romania in Romanian, please? In Romanian? Ah. Ce mi place cel mai mult? No, o viață liniștită, paisajul, padurile, satele tradiționale, viața tradițională, o comunitate, o, o viață între oameni care nu mai prea avem, nu avem acest lucru în, în Anglia. No, nu am fost niciodată într-o o, o țară unde, de exemplu, poți să mergi să, să te plimbi în padure, nimeni ne zice că nu ai voie să mergi acolo, te plimbi și e foarte liber aici viața în general și nu e, e stricat de la o, o modernitate urât. Every year, spring in the Carpathians brings a steadily increasing number of cultural travellers who flood here to marvel at the beauty of the wild flowers and to stay in traditional comfort. En route to the still timeless allure of the Saxon villages, it's worth stopping off for a spell in the ancient city of Brashov to explore its architectural marvels, like the Black Church, its medieval fortress, or what is claimed to be the world's narrowest street. What also makes Brashov unique is its uncompromised proximity to a national park. In a matter of a few yards, the city finishes and the wilderness begins. For many people who come to Transylvania, 
the months of April, May and June hold the greatest appeal. For the simple chance to see perhaps the most vibrant display of wildflowers in Europe. Thanks to traditional farming techniques and an absence of pesticides and fertilizers, the Carpathian landscape becomes a breathtaking blaze of colour. Botanist John Aykroyd has been coming here every summer for decades and works to encourage the preservation of the hay meadows that supply a unique canvas for this kaleidoscope of wild flowers. We're in a hay meadow, this is a farmer's meadow and it's a working farm and in order to protect this meadow we need first of all to protect the farmer, his family and the farming community and to bring them into the 21st century without destroying what they have created over hundreds of years, thousands, thousands of years. Of years. Mm. Yeah. They're never going to be mainstream, but they have an amazing niche market in a world where people want good quality food and they don't want sort of pesticide residues and what have you. This is such a clean environment and people would pay a premium for this. People in Romania say they love coming to stay in some of the villages and having the sort of food there grannies or aunties um, made them years ago. And this is terribly important, I think. They have some of the best jam I've ever had, some of the best honey I've ever had. They have wonderful milk here. All the milk in the hotels comes from Austria or Hungary or Poland. It's crazy. This is a major problem that people are, are, are selling, for example, watermelons from Turkey. Yes. When you produce some of the best watermelons in Romania mm. that you can have anywhere. Mm. And a lot of the organic produce that grows here is not capitalised on it. People aren't making the most of it. What's nice is that they still make jam from, well, I call it bottled biodiversity. They make jam from wild strawberries, wild blackberries, bilberries from the mountains, cornelian cherries, sour cherries from the woods, this sort of thing. And that shows that the biodiversity can support the rural economy just as it did through centuries. For example, in the Saxon villages where we are now, the village houses are big. They sometimes have two, even three storeys. Those aren't the houses of very poor people. These people were once prosperous. And I, I feel that it could be the same again if they were encouraged to use the land wisely. Obviously, education is, has got a big part yeah. to play in this because mm. in places that are remote in Romania, people can actually go and buy organic cheese or organic fruit and veg that's been grown locally and it won't cost them so much. Absolutely. The thing I often get is, oh, you come here to look at our wildflowers. Surely your wildflowers in Britain must be better. Uh, no, they're not. <laughs> we've destroyed... Well, we never had so many anyway. This place is naturally very rich. And then we've gradually destroyed them all. And it terrifies me that that could happen here. And it would be such a waste. The Romanians have one of the most precious resources of biodiversity in Europe, if not in the world. And they, they really must protect it. it. It made this country rich. Carpathia provides a habitat for over two-thirds of Europe's wolves and bears. Its rich biodiversity and eye-watering beauty also draws people here from around the globe to walk and hike amongst endless forests and rugged plateaus. For friend and environmentalist Alex Cavan, this was the landscape of his childhood and one that inspired him to climb some of the highest peaks in the world. That was a nice climb. Yeah. Gentle, but very beautiful. Want some water? Uh, no. Got nurses. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Do you want a beer? No, I'd love, I'd love to join you, Charlie, on this, but I'm on training. You're in training. I think I'll stick to the, well, uh, my water. As you can probably tell, I'm not in training, so. Yeah. Cheers. No rock. <laughs> Talking of bears, have you had any close encounters? I think I, I met bear maybe 30 times in the wild. A couple of years ago, after a difficult winter climb in Bucej with one of my friends, we were at a restaurant in the upper Sinaya, and mother bear with her three cubs, they were coming close to the restaurant, you know, to, to look for the garbage. What uh, so I did was to throw stone in their the direction. Universe. Yeah, exactly. Why? Because if they get to, to, to be too familiar with humans, after they 
grew up, that this will be a big danger. Yes. danger for them. There are a lot of people complaining by the damage the bears in Romania and the wolves are doing to the grazing sheep, for example, in the mountains. But you know, comparing with the numbers of these animals, the damage they are doing to the livestock, it's minor. I mean, for you as a Romanian state to just compensate these people who lose the animals, it's nothing comparing with the treasure yeah. of this wildlife still being there, you know. I think also they need to make it easier for the shepherds, for example, who lose their livestock to get compensated because many of them can't fill in the appropriate forms, they don't know how to do it, so they get more shepherd dogs instead, which means that then there's impact on the bear numbers and baby bears. Exactly. And, and this, this escalates. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want my children to only see bears at the zoo or in the books. I mean, it's great when we get to the base of the forest, you know, we have big, big chance then to see a bear. That is something extraordinary. The problem is they're losing their habitat, as we both know, at you know, three hectares an hour. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the rate of deforestation in Romania is, is, uh, is dramatic and actually increased in the, in, the, in the last years from like 30 cases like four years ago to almost 100 cases of illegal logging recorded per day last year. You know, according to an environmental investigation agency report, around 60% of all the wood that comes out from the Romanian forest is illegal in one way or another. So this is huge, I think. Do you think the future's green for your great-grandchildren? I mean, do you think they'll be able to sit up here and look out to the far horizon and just see forest? That's a good question. And as you know, I am an incurable optimist. optimist. You are. Yes, <laughs> but... <laughs> In order for this green future to be a reality and for us to succeed, we must realize, us as a country, us as mankind, that the, the forest is not timber, the wildlife is not game, and for us to, to succeed, we must not be few. As the frantic bloom of spring relaxes towards summer, the wheel of life comes full circle and we reach the end of our journey. And we finish our odyssey in the Retazat Mountains near here, the castle that Jules Verne wrote about with such passion. Because life is an unfolding story, and each year the story repeats itself, it becomes a little less colorful, as fewer species and less of the natural world remains to celebrate it. So it's down to us. We can pressure the authorities to do more to protect Romania's natural and cultural resources and to curb the efforts of big business to exploit its precious heritage. We can choose long-term prosperity over short-term gain and safeguard this fragile paradise for future generations. Or we can fall into the same traps as the rest of Europe and destroy the very things that make this country unique. Thank you.